After the period we know as the medieval age, the world underwent a transformation, with increased technological advancement and increased interaction. Though we view the 1450s as the beginnings of the Age of Discovery, a time when Europe set sail to new lands, many of these areas had already been connected through vibrant merchant routes. The spice trade had been going on for centuries in the Indian Ocean, connecting Muslim trading communities with India, China, and Southeast Asia. Check out our previous videos on the Americas, the African Kingdoms, and Southeast Asia, if you'd like to see these regions before the arrival of Europe. While we don't know exactly when Islam reached Southeast Asia, it already had a presence by the 1200s, coalescing in Arche, on the northern coast of Sumatra. In the late 1300s, Parameshwara, the last Hindu Raja of Singapore, was under attack by either the Thai to the north, or Majapahit to the south, so he fled to a small village nearby. Here, other refugees would gather, and it soon became a cosmopolitan center with Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims. This port city became of utmost importance, as it controlled the trading passageway from the Indian Ocean to East Asia. By around 1400, because most of the business passing through his domains were Muslim merchants, Parameshwara changed his name to Iskandar Shah and converted to Islam. In so doing, he founded the Malacca Sultanate, the first major Muslim state in the region. The name could be derived from the Arabic, Malakat, meaning congregation of merchants, or it could be from the Malacca tree. After becoming a protectorate of Ming China, they were safe from both the Thai and the Majapahit. The Sultanate's position led to an economic boom and made the small Sultanate the leading power in Southeast Asia. Through the city's ports, Islam was spread to all the nearby islands. Islam continued to spread at the other end of the Old World as well. In West Africa, the spread had already begun since the last period, again through traders and merchants. The Ghana Empire had converted to Islam before it was conquered, and the Mali Empire continued until it was replaced by a new, and even bigger power. East of Timbuktu, on the Niger River, was the major trading hub of Gao. From there, a local chieftain, Soni Ali, took power as the Mali Empire began to dissolve and expanded his territory. This became the Songhai Empire, a name derived from the Songhai people of the Niger and Mali. This empire came to exceed the Mali Empire in size, strength, and even wealth. Around 1500, the Soni dynasty was deposed by Askia Mohammed, or Askia the Great. It became quite centralized, and Islam became a part of daily life, although many rural areas remained animists. The Trans-Saharan market multiplied under the Askia dynasty, with the increased trading of gold, salt, and slaves. Despite a series of coups and political instability, the Songhai were relatively stable by the mid-1500s. Though Islam continued to expand, the new age of exploration would belong to another. It could have been Ming China, with their fleets of treasure ships, but they reverted to isolationism, leaving the door open for Europe. During the medieval period, Europe had dabbled in expansionism, first with the Viking settlements on Iceland, Greenland, and brief colonization of Vinland across the Atlantic. In the east, Europeans also expanded through the establishment of the Crusader states in the Levant. But none of these would come to last, and their main contact with foreign lands was through Italian merchants. Once the Ottomans conquered the eastern Mediterranean, routes directly to the east became heavily administered with higher taxes and newer regulations, as the Ottomans and Venetians held a monopoly. So perhaps there was another way to reach the east, perhaps across the vast ocean to the west or to the south. Shipbuilders and sailors took what they learned from other cultures, and mixed it with their own techniques. From China, they used the sternpost rudder. From the Arab Dows, the Latin sail also used earlier by the Romans, and from the Vikings and other northerners, the square rig. Together, these would form the versatile and nimble caravel, a sturdy yet speedy sailing ship. They were large enough to transport goods and heavy weaponry like cannons, and could sail against the wind.
caravels were primarily used for exploration and coastal trade. They were well suited for long distance voyages and were the preferred choice for early European explorers. As trade developed, they would switch to the Carrick, a larger and more substantial ship compared to the Caravel. It featured a high rounded stern and a large cargo hold, giving it the capacity to carry more goods and supplies. Carracks were primarily used for long distance exploration, trade, and colonization. These would be the predecessor to the mighty Galleon. The Galleon was a specialized warship that emerged in the 16th century. It was an evolution of the Carrick design, but with a more streamlined hull and improved artillery capabilities. Galleons were heavily armed with cannons and were designed for both warfare and trade, and played a significant role in the military conflicts and power struggles between European nations during the Age of Exploration. For navigation, European explorers used the compass, another device from China, and the astrolabe, a Greek invention heavily utilized by the Arabs during the medieval age. The first major explorers of this new age of discovery were the Portuguese. The Kingdom of Portugal had become independent from the Kingdom of Leon back in the 1100s, and rested on the western edge of the Iberian Peninsula, with easy access to the ocean. Exploration began early, well before the Ottoman conquests, under the patronage of Dom Enrique of Portugal or Prince Henry the Navigator. His motives for exploration were simple. God, glory, and gold. For God, he wanted to expand the kingdom of Christendom and perhaps locate the legendary Christian African king, Prester John. For glory, he wanted to weaken the Muslim presence still in and around Iberia and fend off the Corsair raids from North Africa. He had already convinced his father, King John I, to capture the Muslim port of Ceuta in 1415. And for gold, well that is self-explanatory. After Henry established a school for navigators, ships soon poured out of Portugal to the coasts of Western Africa. Their goal was the Trans-Saharan trade and the source of its gold, as well as seeing the limits of Islamic influence in the region. During the first half of the 1400s, the Portuguese settled islands off the coast, like the Azores and Madeira. By 1441, Portuguese ships reached the Senegal River, and then returned to Portugal. But their cargo wasn't gold. It was slaves. Raids would continue, as the Portuguese brought more slaves back to Portugal and sold them across Europe. The raids soon transitioned into forming trade networks with the local African nobility. Though slaves weren't their primary motive, the Portuguese had found success in bypassing the Trans-Saharan trading routes. By 1471, the Portuguese had arrived on the southern shores of the Hump of Africa, and found a source of gold. They would call this, the Gold Coast, in present-day Ghana. Other nearby coastal regions would later be named for what they provided, such as the Grain Coast, Ivory Coast, and the Slave Coast. The Portuguese made contact with the Kingdom of Benin, set up their own fortifications on leased land, and traded in gold, ivory, and slaves. Soon after, they continued south, reaching the Kingdom of Congo. While trade was still slow, the Portuguese found new hope. In 1487, Bartolomeu Dias, a Portuguese explorer, became the first European to round the southern tip of Africa which later came to be known as the Cape of Good Hope. He discovered the best method around it was from the open ocean, using the westerly winds of the South Atlantic. The Portuguese now had a plan to reach India. A decade later, Vasco da Gama, another Portuguese explorer, continued the journey around the Cape with the first Indian Armada, and stopped at the bustling port cities on the Swahili coast. With the help of a local navigator who was familiar with these seas, Vasco da Gama and his crew sailed east, past the Arabian Sea, and in 1498, they finally landed. They had made it to Calicut. They had made it to India. Da Gama and his crew became the first to make the voyage from Europe to India by sea, and Portugal took advantage of the spice trade, totally unopposed by any other European power. This also broke the Ottomans' control over the spice trade in Europe. 
da Gama filled up his ships and a few months later, returned to Portugal. After a rocky return journey, the ships that made it back entered the port filled with peppers and cinnamon. Those traders of the Indian Ocean weren't impressed with the somewhat primitive iron products brought over by the Portuguese, so no permanent trading posts were established. Nonetheless, the voyage was a resounding success for Portugal and its investors. In 1500, Pedro Álvarez Cabral undertook a second major voyage for Portugal with the second Indian Armada, a fleet larger, and better armed than the first. They followed the same route as Vasco da Gama, but accidentally went off course, leading Cabral and his crew to a pleasant surprise. They became the first Europeans to reach the eastern part of South America, and laid claim to it in the name of the King of Portugal, Manuel I. Afterwards, they continued on to India, but while they failed to form a trade treaty with Calicut, they formed one with Calicut's enemies in coaching. Because of the various nations and entities in this trade network, the Portuguese attempted to take it over completely, and lay claim to the entire Indian Ocean. In 1505, the king established Portuguese India, a Portuguese state on the subcontinent. This was headed by its viceroy, Francisco de Almeida, one of Portugal's leading explorers and nobles, who was tasked with setting up forts along the coast. Tensions flared up between Muslim communities, Calicut and the Portuguese, leading to the Battle of Diu in 1509 where the Portuguese won a resounding victory over a local coalition supported by the Mamluks and Ottomans, opening the door for European hegemony over Southeast Asian trade. This early Portuguese exploration set them up to have a presence on almost every continent, from Europe, to the Americas, Africa, and Asia. In 1510, Portuguese Admiral, Afonso de Albuquerque, set up a base on the western coast of India, at Goa. From there, they built more fortresses and ports on both the Indian and East African coasts, raiding merchant ships. But the most coveted prize of all, was the link to the Far East, the Strait of Malacca, controlled by the Malacca Sultanate. It was from here, that all the sea trade between the wealthy Chinese and Indians would take place. An attack was launched from Portuguese India, and in August 1511, Malacca fell to the Portuguese after a fierce battle. The city was captured, and Sultan Mahmud Shah fled. The Portuguese looted the city and seized control of the lucrative spice trade. The Malacca Sultanate collapsed, replaced by Portuguese Malacca. Their control of the strait sent the Arab trading networks into steep decline and gave Portugal access to the Spice Islands. These were the Malaccas, located in present-day Indonesia, the source of nutmeg, mace, and cloves. Portugal made contact with a local sultan there, and by 1512, established themselves and began exporting spices. With the African coasts, India, the Malacca Strait, and the Spice Islands, Portugal quickly became the foremost merchants in the Indian Ocean trade. The Portuguese also made contact with China by 1513, and Japan in the 1540s, where a Jesuit priest would establish a Christian mission. The capture of Malacca marked the beginning of Portuguese hegemony in Southeast Asia, paving the way for further European colonial expansion in the region. But, the Portuguese weren't equipped to maintain their position. Their numbers were too small to establish a more permanent presence, and they were foiled and weakened by resistance from rival traders. Though the Portuguese had established the farthest territorial conquest in the history of the world until that point, their most prominent rivals were those closest to them, their Iberian neighbors, the Spanish. By this time, voyages had been launched to the west, across the Atlantic, by a certain Italian explorer named Christopher Colombo in his native Genoese, but is known better to us as Christopher Columbus. Instead of traveling around Africa, Columbus believed he could take a better route to the spice trade. Most educated people knew the world was round by this point, and Columbus believed the world was much smaller than general consensus, and that the Atlantic was undoubtedly the faster route. To sponsor his voyage, he first went to the Portuguese in the 1480s, but they didn't buy into his plan. 
so Columbus took his talents to Queen Isabella of Castile, Portugal's fierce rival. They were fresh off of ending Muslim rule in Spain, and were looking for new trading routes to the east, hoping to beat the Portuguese who still hadn't reached India yet. The Spanish sponsored an initial expedition, and Columbus set sail into the unknown in 1492. Over a month later, he struck land, and he believed his mission was accomplished. But unbeknownst to him, he landed in the Bahamas, a land he called San Salvador. His ships continued exploring the Caribbean, coming upon Cuba and Hispaniola, where he founded a settlement called La Navidad. He shipped back six native captives to Spain, a people called the Taino, whom we've covered in our video on the Americas. He made three subsequent voyages, sending back even more captives, most of whom would perish en route, or from disease. Columbus still believed he had reached Asia, even calling the islands the Indies, and continued searching for a route to the mainland. But the closest he'd get, was to the mainland of Central America, a site he called Honduras, because of the depths of the water on the coast. He also reached Venezuela in South America. Though still celebrated in the United States, his legacy is tainted by his brutal mistreatment of both the Taino and his own Spanish settlers. After Columbus's initial voyage to the Caribbean, despite his working for the Spanish, the Portuguese claimed it as their own. To avoid conflict between the two states, Spain and Portugal divided up the world into their own respective spheres of influence, called the Treaty of Tordesillas. One hemisphere was to belong to Spain, the other to Portugal. Because of South America's hump, discovered by Cabral after the treaty, this region fell within the Portuguese sphere. Though Columbus died thinking he had made it to Asia, others recognized this was a totally different world. While Columbus was the first European to set foot on South American soil, it was Amerigo Vespucci, an explorer from Florence, who correctly identified the lands as a new continent separate from Asia. His writings and maps played a crucial role in disseminating this knowledge to Europe, and contributed to the recognition of the Americas as a distinct landmass, eventually leading to its naming as the New World. In 1503 and 1505, two booklets were published under his name, offering vibrant descriptions of his voyages with both the Spanish and Portuguese. Soon after, the region would appear on maps, named after Amerigo Vespucci, as America. Despite their discovery of a major new landmass, the Spanish still attempted to reach the Moluccas by traveling west. In September 1519, Magellan set sail from Seville, Spain, with a fleet of five ships, aiming to reach the Spice Islands by crossing the Atlantic, heading south, and sailing through South America's Strait, which later became known as the Strait of Magellan, and then crossing the Pacific Ocean. Although Magellan did not live to complete the entire journey, as he was killed in the Philippines during a conflict with locals, his expedition continued under the leadership of Juan Sebastian Elcano. The remaining crew finally arrived in the Spice Islands in 1521. This accomplishment proved that it was indeed possible to reach the East Indies by sailing westward, and it opened up new possibilities for global exploration and trade for European powers in the centuries that followed. The crew then returned to Spain via the Cape of Good Hope, performing the first circumnavigation of the globe. After skirmishes with the Portuguese over the Spice Islands, the Spanish soon sold their holdings to them. They did keep a presence in Southeast Asia in the Philippines, but their main focus was now on the New World. Though the Portuguese beat them to the spice trade, the Spanish Empire would grow much larger because of their new discovery. Though the Europeans deemed themselves discoverers of a new world, the Americas had been inhabited for millennia. Because the Spanish felt they had lost the race to the east to the Portuguese, they showed little restraint in their exploitation of this new world. This was done through a class of soldier explorers known as conquistadors. In 1519, one of these conquistadors, a Spaniard named Hernán Cortés, landed on the Gulf of Mexico and made contact with the locals. These were the Aztec, rulers of a vast Central American empire, centered at the capital of Tenochtitlan, 
The Aztec king, Montezuma, welcomed Cortes, believing he was a representative of the feathered serpent god, Quetzalcoatl. The iron armor of the Spanish, their loud weapons of gunpowder, and their quick and sturdy four-legged beasts, certainly seemed otherworldly. Their preoccupation though was with something far more earthly. Gold. Tensions would soon rise though, and reach a boiling point when the Spanish took Montezuma captive and started to destroy Aztec religious monuments. The people of Tenochtitlan rose up and drove the Spanish from the city. Cortes and the Spanish had very few soldiers themselves, so formed an alliance with another group of locals, the Tlaxcala, and besieged Tenochtitlan. The battle raged for months, and finally ended in 1521, after a smallpox outbreak devastated the city. This disease was nothing new for the Spanish, and they had better immunity against it. The city was destroyed, and the survivors, slain. With the Mesoamerican hegemonic power defeated, the Spanish set their sights on South America, and its most powerful state. This was the domain of the Empire of the Inca, centered on Cusco, in the Andean mountain range. The invasion was headed by Francisco Pizarro, a conquistador of poorer upbringing. He crossed the Isthmus of Panama, with his target set on Peru. After two failed expeditions, his third was more successful. In 1532, his small force of under 200 men captured the Inca Emperor Atahualpa, at the Battle of Cajamarca. 2,000 were killed, mostly unarmed attendants and counselors, and around 7,000 taken prisoner. A ransom was demanded for the emperor's release, and even though he filled the room with gold for his captors, he was executed a year later. The Incas attempted to retake their capital of Cusco, but were defeated. A rump state, the Neo-Inca Empire, emerged by 1537, and resisted the Spanish for decades. But by 1572, the Spanish conquered the last Inca stronghold, and executed the last emperor, Tupac Amaru. During this time, more settlements were established throughout the Americas. Because of the distance between the New World and Spain, the Spanish crown appointed official representatives, called viceroys, to rule over different regions, called viceroyalties. The first was the Viceroyalty of New Spain, established in 1535. Its main territory was the Caribbean, most of Central America, and the southwestern United States but it also claimed jurisdiction of the Philippines and other Pacific Islands. Florida had a permanent European settlement by 1565 and became part of New Spain, but the Spanish never saw much value in the location, as there was no mineral wealth to be found, and attacks from northern settlers would come to be frequent. In 1542, the Viceroyalty of Peru was established, mostly in South America. In the 1700s, the viceroyalties of La Plata and New Granada were established. Most prominent positions in the bureaucracy were held by Criollos, those of full Spanish descent born in the Americas. They linked their trade in the Americas, with their settlements in the Philippines, through the Manila galleons, large royal trading ships. They carried precious Asian products, like spices and porcelain, from their base in Manila, to the port of Acapulco and picked up silver to return across the Pacific. Meanwhile, the Portuguese set up their own colony in eastern South America. Cabral found this region littered with the Pau Brazil, or Brazilwood tree, and so, the land became known as Brazil. Though initially after gold and silver, they first exploited this Brazilwood to boost their economy and then moved on to sugar production, a highly lucrative crop. A formal government was set up in 1549 under Governor Tomi de Souza. Though Portugal had their piece of land here, the Spanish would come to forge an empire spanning the continent through North, Central, and South America, integrating with the native population. Those mixed indigenous and European, came to be called mestizos. Once African slaves were brought over, they also mixed with the Europeans, forming their own class called mulatto, though the term is considered outdated and offensive in many languages, as it is derived from the word mule. Soon, Latin America became quite multiracial, quite quickly. <laughs>
mass conversions were common, as Catholic missionaries spread all over Latin America. This spiritual conquest was a crucial part of Spain's colonial efforts. Conversions were headed by religious orders like the Franciscans and Dominicans. Most of their conversions were done through village work, or through the schools set up by the church. But though the Spanish fulfilled glory through conquest, and God through conversions, all that was left to claim, was the gold. Locals were well aware of the conquistador's insatiable appetite for gold. By the mid-1600s, over 200 tons of gold and almost 20,000 tons of silver was mined and sent back to Spain. They prospered not only with mineral wealth, but through agriculture. Both Portugal and Spain had a thriving market exporting sugar, tobacco, chocolate, and many other natural resources. At the start, agricultural labor was done by immigrants from Europe, but soon they began exploiting the native populations through a system called the encomienda. In this system, the crown rewarded Spanish conquerors with control over a piece of land. The indigenous people in this community were to provide tributes to the owner, called the encomendero, and provide him with a certain amount of laborers. In return, they were to receive protection and an education, mostly in Catholic instruction and the Spanish language. But with the crown too far away to regulate, the encomienda broke down fairly quickly, turning into a system of coerced and heavily underpaid labor. Natives were taken and forced to work in harsh conditions on sugar plantations and silver mines. Because of the taxing work conditions, droughts, and new diseases introduced by the Spanish, entire populations perished. Before the Spanish conquest, Mesoamerica was home to several advanced civilizations, including the Aztecs, Maya, and other indigenous groups. The estimated pre-conquest population of the region ranges from around 15 to 25 million people. By the year 1800, the indigenous population of Mesoamerica is estimated to have decreased to somewhere between 1 to 2.5 million. Seeing the injustice firsthand, a Dominican monk, Bartolomé de las Casas, published works describing the atrocities committed by the Spanish against the native population. The most famous of these was a short account of the destruction of the Indies. It was sent to King Philip of Spain, and by 1542, the encomienda system was abolished in most regions, and a set of laws, called the New Laws was implemented. This meant those of Latin America had to look elsewhere for labor. But what was transpiring to the north? On the heels of the Portuguese and Spanish, three other rivals took to the seas, sailing into their own age of exploration. The English, under their first Tudor king, Henry VII, commissioned a voyage for Venetian navigator, Giovanni Caboto, or John Cabot. His 1497 voyage was the first to explore the North American coasts since the Vikings 500 years earlier. Another expedition was launched in 1498, but Cabot vanished, and the outcome remains a mystery. Cabot and his ships were deemed to have been destroyed during a storm on the ocean, but it's possible he did reach the coast of Canada again, and was either killed there, or enjoyed a life among the indigenous. Cabot's voyages were the genesis of an English North America. There is some speculation that the Portuguese had reached eastern Canada as far back as the 1470s, under Joao Vaz Corte Real, on a joint expedition with the Danish. The mysterious region was called the New Land of Codfish, some claiming it to be Newfoundland. Evidence still remains fragmentary though, and the first mention of the discovery was from a book written a century later. It's more certain that his sons, Gaspar and Miguel, made it to Newfoundland later, but both were lost, on two separate expeditions. Joao Fernandes Lavrador, deemed to be the first European to reach Labrador, also vanished during an expedition in 1501. The Corte Real brothers, Lavrador, and Cabot, all disappeared during expeditions from 1498 to 1502, and all might have shared the same fate. Later, during the mid-1500s, an English explorer, Francis Drake, became a privateer under the license of Queen Elizabeth I, and began raiding and plundering Spanish ships and towns, 
beginning an era of piracy along the Spanish main. In 1577-1580, he completed the first English circumnavigation of the globe, and during the Anglo-Spanish War in 1585, he helped defeat the Spanish Armada that was sent to England. In 1603, peace was restored, and the English focused on creating their own settlements, instead of disrupting others. By 1607, the English had their first permanent settlement on the continent, at Jamestown. It was founded by the Virginia Company, though their charter would soon be revoked, and ownership would be held by the English Crown directly. In 1620, Plymouth was settled by Puritans facing religious persecution back in Europe. They became known as the Pilgrims. The British took over most of the northeastern coast through the 1600s, forming new colonies like Connecticut, Maryland, and Rhode Island. In the 1620s, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Barbados were settled. Later in the century, they would acquire Jamaica from the Spanish, and colonize the Bahamas. Their rivals, the Dutch, made their own chartered companies, the Dutch East India, and later Dutch West India Company. They settled on the eastern coast of North America, and in 1624, founded a new province called New Netherland, with a capital at New Amsterdam, in present-day Manhattan. A contemporary letter had stated, that Manhattan Island was bought from the locals for an amount of beads and trinkets worth a mere $24, or just over $1,000 US dollars today. In 1638, the Swedes also set up a colony, New Sweden, across the Delaware, but it was soon annexed by New Netherland. The traditional log cabin design used by pioneers was first brought over by these Swedish and Finnish settlers. During the 16 and 1700s, the British and Dutch fought a series of naval wars over commercial rights. The second of these began in 1664, when the English captured Fort Amsterdam, and New Netherland would then be replaced by the English province of New York. Fighting over control of the sugar-producing regions of the Caribbean and Brazil continued throughout the 1600s. Also seeking a route to the Pacific were the French. Under the commission of French King Francis I, an Italian explorer, Giovanni de Verrazzano became the first European to explore the eastern American seaboard between New Spain and Newfoundland. In 1534, the king sent Jacques Cartier, a French explorer born in Brittany, to explore the interior of North America. Cartier's voyages down the St. Lawrence River are regarded as the first European expeditions to the interior of North America. He planted a cross on the Gaspé Peninsula, naming the land the country of the Canadas. It was from the word Kanata, of the local St. Lawrence Iroquois language, a word meaning village or settlement. Cartier claimed the region for the French king, and it was the start of what would become New France. By 1712, New France reached its greatest extent, with five colonies, Canada, Hudson Bay, Acadie, Terre-Neuve, and Louisiana, spanning from the Atlantic in the east to the Rockies in the west, and from Hudson Bay in the north to the Gulf of Mexico to the south. Though quite large, the French lagged behind the English territories in population as they were initially set up as small-scale mercantile colonies. It was only during the 1660s that the colonies were given a governing body, under Jean Talon, and were given the proper means to establish population colonies like the British. But by the 1700s, because of politics in Europe, the French slowly lost their territories in the Americas to Britain and Spain. Apart from New France, the French also laid claim to islands in the Caribbean, like Guadeloupe and Martinique. Their most fruitful possession was the colony of Saint-Domingue in the western half of Spanish Hispanola, today known as Haiti. Haiti became the highest sugar-producing colony in the entire Caribbean. As the Caribbean became a magnet for many European powers, it inevitably attracted European conflict as well. Though Francis Drake raided ships as a privateer, he was viewed as anything but legitimate by the Spanish. By the mid-1600s, the governments of Europe were destabilized and exhausted from constant war, so there was little to prevent a resurgence of robbery and plunder in their colonies. <laughs>
For almost a century, this was the theme, in the Golden Age of Piracy. During the early phase of the Golden Age of Piracy, the focus was on buccaneers and privateers who operated primarily in the Caribbean and the surrounding areas. Buccaneers were originally hunters and adventurers who survived by hunting wild cattle and pigs in the Caribbean islands, but many turned to piracy as a means of survival. They established bases on islands, like at Tortuga, near Haiti, and Port Royal on Jamaica, from which they launched raids on Spanish colonies and shipping. A large coalition formed, called the Brethren of the Coast. Over time, these Anglo-French buccaneers swelled with Spaniard outlaws, escaped slaves, and other adventurers. The buccaneers' attacks on Spanish ships and colonies brought them wealth and fame, but they often operated outside the boundaries of any established authority. The Caribbean became a chaotic and lawless region as buccaneers clashed with Spanish forces, and engaged in piracy against ships of various nations. In 1670, a Welsh buccaneer, Henry Morgan, led the Brethren of the Coast on an expedition, managing a successful raid on Panama City, sacking and destroying it, a huge blow to the Spanish. The second phase saw the rise of the so-called Pirate Republics and marked the peak of pirate activities. Pirates established bases in remote and hard-to-reach locations, transforming them into havens for their illicit activities. One of the most famous pirate havens was Nassau in the Bahamas, where pirates formed their own communities and governments. Prominent pirate figures like Bartholomew Roberts, Arne Bonny, and Calico Jack became legendary during this phase. Pirates targeted merchant ships regardless of nation, looted coastal towns, and created an atmosphere of fear and lawlessness on the high seas. Edward Teach, or the infamous Blackbeard, operated around this time. His ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, was originally a French slave ship, before he captured it and turned it into a pirate vessel. The final phase of the Golden Age of Piracy saw a resurgence in pirate activities, as another long war in Europe had just ended, and seamen were relieved of their military duties. As the number of pirates multiplied, Europeans took this as a legitimate threat, and European governments and colonial powers intensified their efforts to eliminate piracy. The pirate hunting Woods Rogers captured Nassau in 1718, signaling the end of the Pirate Republic there. Other pirate hunters and naval patrols actively pursued pirates, resulting in the capture and execution of many notorious figures. Pirates faced growing challenges as naval forces became more organized and effective in combating them. Prominent pirates, like Blackbeard, were killed in confrontations with naval authorities, and pirate havens were dismantled. The once-feared pirates were gradually brought to justice or forced into obscurity. By the 1720s, the era of widespread piracy had come to an end. The decline of piracy was influenced by factors such as the growing power of colonial empires, the establishment of stronger naval forces, and the efforts of governments to restore law and order on the seas. The Golden Age of Piracy remains a captivating period in history, characterized by tales of adventure, conflict, and daring escapades on the high seas. Over in Africa, the Portuguese had firmly established themselves in the east, building forts along the shores of Mozambique, and sacking and burning Kilwa and Mombasa on the Swahili coast. If you recall from our episode on the African kingdoms, the southeastern region of Africa was home to the Shona, of the Kingdom of Zimbabwe. They had a monopoly on the gold trade, but by the late 1400s, another Shona state, the Kingdom of Mutapa, or Moene Mutapa, emerged. They controlled both the gold and salt trade after abandoning the old capital of Great Zimbabwe and migrating north. This brought them into contact with the Portuguese. Relations were friendly at the start, as the Portuguese helped the Mutapa against their rivals, and took up service as political advisors. They both entered into a formal agreement by the 1560s, trading in gold, and setting up prazos, land grants for Portuguese settlement. These colonies eventually became Portuguese Mozambique. Over time though, the Portuguese simply did not have the numbers to protect themselves, 
and the Arabs began attacking and seizing their port cities. The Portuguese also came under attack here, from the Dutch. After a failed attack on the island of Mozambique, the Dutch set up a base on the Cape of Good Hope in 1652. It was to be a stop on the long route from the Dutch Republic to the spice routes of the east. It turned from a temporary resupply station into a more permanent colony. Free burghers from Holland would settle here and work the land, and their descendants came to be called Boers, the Dutch word for farmers. Over time, a distinct language called Afrikaans developed, a Dutch language with elements of German and the native Khoisan. By the end of the 1600s, the Dutch had used this location to reduce Portuguese presence in Africa, and supplant them in the spice trade to the east. Though those Africans in the interior had no direct links to Europeans, those on the coasts were most affected by what would come to be known as the transatlantic slave trade. Like in most civilizations, slavery existed in Africa well before the arrival of the Europeans, and slaves were usually captives or prisoners of war. Many worked as domestic servants, or on farms for local nobles. Many could also buy their freedom under certain circumstances. Once Islam penetrated the Sahara in the previous period, the slave market increased, and by the time of the Songhai, King Askia was well involved in the selling of slaves to Arab merchants, who would then send them all over the Middle East. Europe was also very familiar with slavery, with the largest group of slaves being the Slavs from Eastern Europe. Slave traders from North Africa would also raid European shorelines, seeking captives. And this became known as the Barbary slave trade. One of their most famous captives was Miguel de Cervantes, a soldier who would go on to write Don Quixote, one of the major centerpieces of world literature. When the Portuguese reached the West and Central African coasts in the mid-1400s, the slaves they captured or bought were brought back to Portugal and served mainly as domestic servants. It was only in the early 1500s, once setting up their sugarcane plantations in Brazil, that more labor became necessary. Alongside the tobacco and cotton industries, sugar became the lifeblood of the Spanish and Portuguese agricultural economy in the Americas. It had been native to Southeast Asia, but moved west during the spice trade, and was eventually introduced to Europe during the Middle Ages. The plantations in the Americas offered a much better climate for the growing of the sugarcane plant, and large-scale plantations were set up in both Spanish and Portuguese regions, like Brazil and the Caribbean, where it was both warm enough and had an ample supply of water. Because of demographic decline from disease, the indigenous Brazilians weren't enough to sustain these plantations, and as the Portuguese had already been involved in the use of African slaves in other parts of their empire, including in plantations on the islands of Madeira and Sao Tomé, they turned to Africa for a labor supply in Brazil. The first voyages carried African slaves from Portugal to Brazil, but slaves would soon be shipped from Africa directly. From the 1520s onwards, hundreds of thousands of African slaves were sent overseas, the majority of these to the Americas. By the 1800s, this number shot up exponentially, with around 12 to 13 million slaves sent over the Atlantic. The African population of the Caribbean went from 1 in 5 people, to 8 out of 10, vastly surpassing the natives and Europeans. In the 13 colonies, slave populations quadrupled in just over 100 years. This doesn't even include the millions that perished under imprisonment in what were called factories, while awaiting shipment in Africa, and those who died once they arrived in the Americas, in what were called seasoning camps. But the most deaths by far, occurred during what was called the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage, was the long and often deadly journey across the Atlantic. Historians' estimates suggest that the death toll during the Middle Passage was substantial, with conservative estimates ranging from approximately 1.5 to 2 million enslaved Africans who perished during the journey. Some higher estimates put the number closer to 2.5 million or more. Out of every 100 slaves in a shipment, it's estimated 30 to 40 died during the Middle Passage. The conditions on the slave ships were notoriously brutal and inhumane. 
enslaved Africans were packed tightly into the ship's holds, often in unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. They suffered from malnutrition, disease, and abuse during the journey, which could last for several weeks or even months. Many enslaved Africans died due to diseases such as dysentery, smallpox, and scurvy, exacerbated by the harsh conditions and lack of proper nutrition. Suicides and acts of resistance were also documented, as some slaves chose to end their lives or fight back against their captors. Even crew members had high mortality rates, only slightly better than their human cargo. Once slaves arrived in the Americas, they were then bought in the final step of what was called the triangular trade. The first economic step was Europe to Africa, where they would sell guns, textiles, or iron tools, in exchange for these slaves from local traders or nobles. Even more than slaves, gold, and other products like ivory, remained in high demand for centuries. The middle leg, which we had called the Middle Passage, was Africa to the Americas, the transportation of the slaves. And the final step, was the products from the Americas sent back to Europe, like tobacco, sugar, and rum. As slaves were treated as chattel, meaning they were regarded as personal property, life on the plantations was brutal and utterly hopeless. Their treatment was rationalized by educating them and converting them to Christianity, believing saving their souls justified withholding their freedom. Those who converted were sometimes treated less harshly, but many of the enslaved resisted their oppressive conditions in various ways. Some sought freedom by running away from their plantations and seeking refuge in remote and difficult-to-reach areas, such as mountains, swamps, and dense forests. In these secluded locations, they formed maroon communities, where they could live independently and outside the control of slave owners and colonial authorities. The term maroon is believed to have originated from the Spanish word cimarron, which means wild or fugitive. These societies were self-governing and organized their own social, economic, and political systems. The Quilombos of Brazil were settlements formed by escaped slaves, the most famous of which was Quilombo dos Palmares. Located in present-day Alagos and Pernambuco, it was a large and powerful community that resisted Portuguese colonial forces for decades. As life was rough for those overseas, those who remained in Central Africa and Portuguese Angola, suffered as well. Most of the able-bodied men in local communities were lost to the Americas, and birth rates were too low to replenish the lost population. This was less of the case in West Africa, where birth rates remained high. American crops eventually made their way there, like maize and manioc, keeping populations at a steady level. But though stable on a macro level, individual African families were deeply affected all along the coasts. As children were smaller, more of them were allowed to board the ships, so as many as one in five slaves were minors. Families were wrenched apart and never saw one another for the rest of their lives, no matter how long or short that ended up being. Furthermore, as the Europeans traded their guns for slaves, African intermediaries became quite powerful and corrupt with these firearms, raiding villages in search of new captives they could sell to meet the ever-increasing demand. The coastal trade market caused many unforeseen consequences. The trans-Saharan trade would begin to decline, as trade took place on the coasts. This left the Songhai Empire, who relied on selling their gold and salt, in a precarious position. By the late 1500s, the empire was in decline, this time irreversibly, and in 1591, a new Moroccan dynasty invaded from the north, and with the use of gunpowder and firearms, conquered the capital of Gao, and the Songhai collapsed. As the last of the great West African kingdoms faded, those on the slave and gold coasts grew to prominence. The Ashanti Empire became the major player in the gold trade in the late 1600s, while the nearby kingdom of Dahomey became a major exporter of slaves. The Portuguese were also one of many factors that led to the decline of the Kingdom of Congo in Central Africa, and the Kingdom of Mutapa in the east. During the late 1600s, a coalition of Omani and Somali forces, expelled the Portuguese from Kenya and Tanzania until Mozambique, 
but the Swahili coast trade never recovered, because of newer trade routes around the Cape of Good Hope. Though the subcontinent, peninsula, and archipelago were massively disturbed by the arrival of the Europeans, the mainland north of the peninsula was significantly less affected. The Portuguese had initiated formal relations with the major kingdoms, like the Burmese, Vietnamese, and the Ayutthaya, who came to supplant the old Khmer Empire as a major player in Southeast Asian trade. But as spices were mainly found on the archipelago, the Europeans had more limited contact with these mainland kingdoms during this period. From Burma, the short-lived Tungu Empire was able to expand rapidly with the use of Portuguese firearms and became the largest and most dominant power in Southeast Asia. Ayutthaya, situated at the crossroads of important trade routes, became a significant player in this competition and managed to maintain a degree of independence, but by the late 18th century, internal and external pressures, along with a series of wars and invasions, led to the downfall of the Ayutthaya Kingdom. In Vietnam, the Portuguese and Dutch attempted to garner influence by backing rival factions, but as trading opportunities were less lucrative, many trading stations were abandoned. Religion in the early modern period in Southeast Asia was similar to the previous period but with the added presence of Christianity. Missionary work was done slowly at first, through occupied port cities, like Malacca and Batavia, and in the Philippines. But by this point, Southeast Asia was still dominated by Buddhism and Islam. Buddhism flourished on the mainland, from Burma to Vietnam, while Islam flourished on the Malay Peninsula and the Indonesian islands. The Hindu-Buddhist Majapahit had been in decline since the 1300s, and its capital was seized by the Demak Sultanate in the mid-1500s. Only Bali remained a Hindu stronghold, as sultans came to control much of the Malay Peninsula and the archipelago. These sultans were thought to possess certain powers, but were still regarded as human. Though they were to act according to Muslim law, known as Sharia, some sultanates became less rigid, and more accommodating to their Muslim subjects, and more tolerant of diverse religious practices, particularly from the 17th century onward. On Java, despite being Muslim, the Javanese kings still kept plenty of Buddhist and Hindu cultural influences, like batik, a dyeing technique for decorating textiles, and the puppet shadow plays called Wayang Kulit. On the mainland, the Buddhist kings of Laos, Cambodia, Ayutthaya, and Burma reigned. Unlike the sultans, these kings were thought to be above humanity because of their pristine karma, acting as a link between their subjects and the eternal universe. And to their east, was Dai Viet, who slowly annexed Champa and some of the old Khmer Empire's territories to establish themselves all along the coast. In Southeast Asia, the Portuguese held sway over the spice trade, but by the 1600s, the British, Dutch, and French, made inroads. The most organized and financially capable were the Dutch, under their Dutch East India Company, or VOC, founded in 1602. They far surpassed the rival English East India Company, set up by the English two years prior. By 1641, the VOC, with the help of Javanese locals, laid siege to Malacca, drove out the Portuguese, and took it for themselves. It remained Dutch Malacca for almost 200 years. Though the Straits of Malacca were important, the VOC's main base was set up in Batavia, present-day Jakarta. Over the next two centuries, their influence spread throughout the Indonesian archipelago, where they set up pepper and clove plantations, worked by slave labor, leading to massive profits for the VOC. It is considered by some, to be the first multinational corporation. In the early 1600s, Willem Janssen became the first European to encounter the landmass that would become Australia. By the mid-1600s, Abel Tasman, also with the VOC, made voyages to the South Pacific, coming upon Tasmania, and New Zealand, which was named after the province of Zealand back in the Dutch Republic. The Dutch also established settlements in Southeast India and Sri Lanka, but by the 1700s, 
they had to contend with the other European powers who came later, primarily the French. The Age of Discovery marked a period of intense economic activity, but more than that, it marked the beginnings of the modern era, a period from which in the present day, we can more clearly see, the results or consequences of the politics, wars, and demographic changes that occurred. From the first naval expeditions, to the thriving trade networks that connected distant lands, the Age of Discovery laid the groundwork for increased interactions between the old and new worlds, shaping their economic and cultural development for centuries to come.